<laughs> Four, three, two, one. Okay, everybody, if I can please trouble you to find your seats. It's always a wonderful thing to chit-chat. But on Ladka Shabbat, which is coming up, you'll have all the time in the world. Nobody will get kicked out early. Of course, when you run out of latkes, you'll probably want to run home crying, but what are you going to do? So we'll get into our, our liturgical portion in just a minute, but I wanted to share a little joke with you that went over really well in Israel. I, I was told a joke during break. I said I'd share one when I had three minutes or more. I'll share it now. So, I, you know, you never know how things translate in different cultures. So I was there, and I was telling them about, you know, me being from Tucson and all, everybody thinks we, we're cowboys. So I told them the story about the Jewish horse. And this guy, he wanted to sell his horse, uh, but he was Jewish. And the cowboy was looking at the horse, and he says, this is a really good horse. And he got, said, yes, and it's a very fast horse. In fact, it's the fastest horse in the West. But it's not like a regular horse. You can't get up on this horse and go, giddy app. He doesn't know what you're saying. It's a Jewish horse. You want the horse to go, you have to say, oi. And if you want him to start galloping and going a little faster, you say, oi, oi. And if you really want him to go, you say, oi, 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 and he'll take off like a bullet. So after checking the teeth, checking the hooves, he says, well, let me give him a test ride. He gets up on the horse, he goes, giddy up. Oh, yeah. Oi. That's pretty cool. Get on. Oh, yeah. Um, oi, oi. All right, let's see what she's got. Oi, oi, oi. Took off like an arrow. Fastest horse this cowboy's ever been on. Having a good old time, just going, going. But up in the way is, you know, it's the cliff. So he's got to slow down. Whoa, whoa. Horse doesn't know whoa. Whoa, whoa. What did he say? What did he say? Uh, getting closer to the cliff, closer to the cliff. Right at the edge of the cliff, he goes, uh, 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 shalom. Oi, oi, oi. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, I went over good there, too. <laughs> Am I, okay, we're going to continue on now with our service. It's hard to get spiritual now, isn't it? <laughs> I will try. Yid Gadal, Vayid Kadash, Shemay Rabbah. Be all my divra hirute, ve am lich mahute, ve chaye chon uv yo me chon, uv chaye de chobet Yisrael, ba agola ba. Now we're going to do the same thing, but in English. I'll read where it says leader, and then you can join me down here where it says congregation. So here's what we said. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the, in the world, world which he hath, hath created according, according to, to his, his will. will. And may he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days. And during the life of all the house of Israel. Even speedily and at a near time. And say ye, Amen. Amen. And let his, his great name, name be blessed, blessed forever, forever and, and for all eternity. eternity. Blessed.
praised and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One, blessed be He. Though He be high above all the blessings and hymns, higher than all the praises, all the consolations which are uttered in this world. And say ye, Amen. Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for you and for all of Israel. And again, say ye, Amen. Amen. He, he who makes, makes peace in, in his high places, places may he, he make peace for us and, and for all Israel, Israel and, and say, Amen. Amen. O se shalom bim ramav, hu ya ase shalom aleinu, ve al kol Yisrael, ve imru, imru amen. O se shalom bim ramav, hu ya ase shalom aleinu, Shalom, ya ase shalom, shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Ya ase shalom, ya ase shalom, shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Ya ase shalom, ya ase shalom, shalom aleinu Yisrael, ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu ve'alko Yisrael, ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu ve'alko Yisrael, o se shalom bim romav. Shalom Aleinu Ve'al Kol Yisrael Ve'imru Imru Amen What we said was, may there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel and say ye, Amen. Amen. Mi Chamocha Ba'elim Adonai Mi Chamocha Nedar Ba'kodesh Nora Tehilot Osefele Shira Chadasha Shebechu Geolim Lashimcha al Sfat Hayom Yachad kulam hodu ve'im lechu ve'om Everybody please rise. Adonai imloch le'olam va'ed Tzur Yisrael kum ba'ezrat Yisrael And we said, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, mighty in holiness, too awesome for praise, doing wonders? With the a new song, song the, the redeemed, redeemed ones praised, praised your name at the seashore. The seashore. Together, Together they, they all gave, gave thanks for, for your kingdom, kingdom and said, seven. and this is where everybody stood, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Rock of Israel, rise to the aid of Israel, and redeem as you spoke, Judah and Israel. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, the Holy One of Israel. 
Blessed are you, O Lord, Redeemer of Israel. Amen and amen. Adonai sahavti tiftahu fi yogi tehilatecha. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall declare thy praise. If God was standing here right now, what would you want to say to him? Well, he's here right now. So we're going to take a couple of minutes to pray silently. Whatever's on your heart and mind, anything that concerns you, anything that you want to ask him for or about, anything you want to thank him for, this is your time with him. A couple of minutes of silent prayer, and then I will close verbally shortly. Lord God, the prayer says, may you open our lips that our mouth might declare your praise. Because sometimes we need your help even in prayer. Not always sure exactly what to pray about or how to pray. And so we pray that your will would be done here in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, in our communities. May you guide every one of our steps into your perfect will. Show us the way and help us to walk in it. We pray for those that don't know you, that their hearts would be touched, that they would make the decision to follow you. We pray for those who do know you, though whose hearts may still be heavy from physical sickness, or financial concerns, or just relational problems. May you bless everybody this morning, and may your name be blessed. For we pray, B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yamod Gary Carter. <laughs> we got to give you a new name, a Hebrew name. Baruch Hu Ad Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech olam, asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim, v'natan lanu et torato, boruch ata Adonai, noten ha-Torah. Amen. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and has given us your Torah. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And today's Torah reading is Exodus 13, verse 12 through 16. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand.
Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Natan Lanu Torat Emet Vechaye Olam Nata Betochenu Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the law of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. So last week, I um, introduced to you the Lord's Prayer. And I told you that in the days of Yeshua, in the days of Jesus, it was quite customary for rabbis to teach their disciples prayers. So John the Baptist's disciples learned prayers from him. And Yeshua's disciples said, well, John taught his disciples to pray. Please teach us how to pray. And so he taught them what is known as the Lord's Prayer. And we looked at the first part of that last week. We're going to look at the second part this week. Um, but I want to draw your attention back to verse 8 that said this. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. So that's the last thing he said right before he taught them how to pray. Then he said, pray then in this way. Let's bring up the prayer, and I'd like you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You know, there's so much going on in this prayer. Like, forgive us our debts. Why did he say debts instead of sins? You'll understand that before you leave this morning. We're going to pick up on give us this day our daily bread. But why do we ask God to give us our daily bread? He knows we need to eat. And it just said in verse 8, the one I pointed out to you, our Father in heaven already knows what we want before we ask. So then why bother asking at all? Why pray at all? God knows everything we're going to ask. And God is awesome. He knows your thoughts before you do. So what's the point in praying? Well, I'll tell you this. It's obviously not to inform him of anything. So whatever the reason is we pray, it's not to tell him something. He knows. And it's funny. We pray, oh, God, you heard about what so-and-so did to me? Yeah, he heard. <laughs> he knows. And I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just telling you that we don't pray because God doesn't know. We don't ask for anything because God doesn't know we need it. He already knows we need it. So why in the world do we ask? Well, I think there's a few reasons for that, this. When we pray to God, we let him know and we let ourselves know who we're depending on. It's one thing to just show up and eat. It's another thing to say, I get this food because you give it to me. In fact, I rely upon you giving it to me day in and day out. We show our dependence, our appreciation, and our reliability on God. And when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, it's hard to say it when your cupboards are full. It's a lot easier to pray that prayer when you don't have a job and you haven't had one in a year and the help from the government is done and you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Then it's easy to pray this prayer. But if you've been employed solidly for 20 years and you've never missed a meal in your life, praying, give us this day our daily bread, might sound a little silly. If a man's got his cupboards full, why in the world would he pray for God to give him his daily bread? Well, let me help you understand why we can do this and how you can do this better in your own private prayer lives. First of all, you go to my house, especially now that Thanksgiving has passed, we can't cram everything in our refrigerator. Everything is stuffed in there. It's full. But I still pray, give us this day our daily bread, because I know who stuffed those cabinets full. And I know that if my income stops today, those cupboards aren't going to stay full for long at all. 
any of you, how would you do if you ran out of money today? Unemployed, no more checks, money stops. How long would you make it? And if you've been employed for 20 years, who do you owe that to? It's not your good looks. God blessed you with the job you have. And so when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're remembering that we are reliant upon God from day-to-day -day basis to stock our cupboards, even if he's been doing it for you for 20 years. When our tummies are full, it's easy to forget who we really owe everything to. Listen to what Moses said. When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a large and beautiful cities which you did not build, Houses full of good things which you did not fill. Hewn out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So God took the slaves, brought them into these cities that were already built, and they occupied. And Moses said, when that happens, don't forget who gave it to you. When our tummies are full, it's easy to forget. Desperate people remember God. Full people have a harder time remembering God. So God gave Israel these things to do so that we would never forget him. He gave us dietary regulations. He told us how to dress. He told us how to pray. He told us how to deal with people. He gave us laws of the land, laws of building codes, health codes. Everything ties to God. I want to talk to you, though, specifically about a few things God gave Israel to do so that they would never forget him, that he brought them out of the land of Egypt and that he's responsible for filling our cupboards. And it starts with the Shema, something that we already sang, Deuteronomy 6, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, listen to what I'm about to say. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God wanted to make sure that when he blessed his people, they did not forget him. And so he gave us all sorts of things to remember him by. In this passage, there are three things he said. So the Jewish people would never forget. Always teach these things to your children. Wrap them and write them. So start with teaching things to your children. You should teach them diligently to your children. When? Every Saturday morning between 10.30 and noon. It's not what it says. Every Friday night when you light the candles. It's not what it says. It says... You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, always. Everything is an opportunity to share about God with your children. Take the lessons to heart when you're walking through the store and it's Halloween and there's evil masks that you wish your children didn't see. Stop and say, why do you think people do this? And then tell them about God and God's perspective on death and demons and the afterlife. Don't just run them out of there. Stop. Teach them what God says. Teach them God's way. Daddy, can we go see such and such a movie? No, we can't. Why? My friends are going. We do things differently than your friends. Let me tell you why I don't want you going to that movie. They say things in that movie that we shouldn't hear things that make our hearts darker than we want them to be. It's hard enough having a good, wholesome life, but being entertained by that filth, not us. When you walk by the way, when you sit down, when you lie down, when you rise up, if we teach our children about God always, we will never forget about God, let alone our children.
By the way, we do have people who teach your children here, teach my children here, teach each other's children here. Support those people. Pray for them. Encourage them. Support them. Join them. Teach the kids. Volunteer. If you don't have kids, teach somebody else's kids. It would be a blessing to you. Yeshua said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In fact, he said somewhere else, unless you become changed and be like little children, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Children can teach us lots of lessons. They're not an annoyance. They're a blessing. We won't forget or belittle God's blessings if we diligently and constantly teach our children about him. That's the first thing in that passage of Scripture that God tells us so we won't forget. The second thing is in verse 8 from that passage in the Torah. It says, You shall bind them. These words which I give to you today shall be in your hearts, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Do we have that picture? Can you pull up that picture for me? How many of you have ever seen those prayer boxes before? They're known as tefillin. Tefillin. This one says, Yod, for the hand. Goes to the weak. I'm a righty, so it goes to my left. If I was a lefty, it would go to my right. And this one says Jerusalem on it, and it says Rosh, for the head. So this is the one that goes on the head. This is the one that goes on the arm. And you see Jewish people do this, and you wonder why that passage of Scripture I just read to you is the why. Let me read it again. You shall bind them, these words of mine, as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, I think it's a figure of speech. It's euphemism for things. And there's evidence for that. But the Jewish community has taken this literally for about at least 2,200 years. So there's some serious reason for taking this literally, literally, traditionally speaking. Back to the days of about 200 B.C., we have historical reference to these tefillin. By the way, after services, you can come up and look at these. These are wrapped. I have a set that are unwrapped because I can't wrap them. I can't wrap them for a couple of reasons. One, because I don't know how. Two, because they're so old and dry that I'm afraid I'll break them. The man who gave these to me about 15, 20 years ago said they were somewhere around 200 years old. I don't know how old they are, but you look at them, you can believe it. And I'll let you see these a little later if you want to also. So since the 3rd century B.C., we have historical evidence that these were being used. Josephus, who was a 1st century historian, said that they were an ancient tradition. So in the first century, in the days of Yeshua, his century, the historian says these have been used since old days. They're referenced in history that the uh, Hashmoneans, the Maccabees, some of them used them. And they were like 150 years before Yeshua. In the New Testament, they're called phylacteries. Uh, you can read about them in Matthew 23, 5. To fill in sounds very much like the Hebrew word tefillah, which means to pray. So I call them prayer boxes, tefillah, tefillin. Phylacteries means protection, almost like an amulet. So perhaps there was a group of Jews at a certain time in history who thought these were like magic amulets that would ward off evil from them. Or maybe the Greeks saw them doing it and ascribed that to them. I do know to this very day, there are some Jewish people who think the mezuzah that we put on our door is a good luck charm, keeps evil away from your house. It's got nothing to do with the mezuzah, but that's what they think. So I could see why these became known as phylacteries in ancient history. But tefillin is the proper word. They're used generally during morning prayers and not on the Sabbath. Though in the old days, there were some Jewish communities, some Jews that wore them all the time. Always mindful of God near their heart and in their head. So the box goes right here by the heart and by this artery, and this one right between the eyes on the forehead. 
and there's a way to, to put them on. They're knotted in a cer certain way so that the three spots have the three letters that spell out the name Shaddai, Almighty God. They're wrapped around the arm so many times and they form a shin on the hand, which is the letter that's on the box and the letter that's on the mezuzah, which is the first letter for Shaddai, the Almighty God. There's a tradition. You put it on, like I said, the weak hand. You put it between your eyes. When you put it on, you can't talk, except for to say the prayers until you're done. All sorts of traditions, I don't know them all. But I've got a video that I'd like to share with you. Let's take a look. Yeah, are you righty or lefty? Lefty? Okay, we're gonna learn how to put the fill in. Because you're lefty, we need your right hand. Right hand is the, is the weak hand. It's treating like a shit fit in the weak hand. But in Torah say Yadcha Yadcha in Hebrew saying in English is to mean like the weak hand. Now you say the bracha Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kidishanu Lemitzvotav Letzivanu Laoniach Olakim Laoniach Filin Filin. Oh man. See that? We got three straps. Make sure you know the knot is close to the heart. We got one strap connecting between the bicep and the forearm. And we're going to have seven straps continuously. And then we stop by the wrist. We stop at the bone. And we just wrap around the arm. Just leave it there. You can just wrap if you want, or just leave it. But don't speak right now. This is the headpiece of the filling. Make sure when you put it on top, it has to go above the hairline. And then now it goes right behind the head. We go back to the handpiece. We're going to do three straps. On the middle finger. You want some picture, can you? Yeah, yeah I got it. Okay, finish that in your hand. You just keep wrapping around your hand. Okay, now I'm going to push. It's very pure. You start saying, uh, better off. So here, you start from here, then you go here to land. Right here, English is over here for you. Actually, it's not English. You can read Russian? So the first time I was in Israel, I stopped by at that booth, because I hadn't done this since I was studying for my bar mitzvah. And I wanted the, the full, full, full blown experience. But the detail, and it's got to wrap this way and this way and that way, it's, I'm not a detailed person. I had to do it over and over and over. Finally, I was like, enough already, I'm done. <laughs> then this last time when I was there, I didn't stop here, but in, in a, the food market in Jerusalem, if you all remember that, um, there was a guy who's recruiting people to do it. And he said, hey, you want to put on tefillin? I'll take a moment. I said, not the way I do it, it won't. So I just walked on by. Ancient traditions, why? So we won't forget. These are wrapped in such a way is to remind us of the 613 commandments that God gave in the Old Testament. So we won't forget. So it said, you shall bind them on, on your eyes and you shall inscribe them on the doorposts of your houses. God's words. And so in Jewish homes throughout the world, we have mezuzahs. This is an example of one. You put it on the doorpost of your house. Again, it's got the shin on there to remind you of God, and you're supposed to put a scroll in the back. There's an a indent for it. And you put it right up against the door of your house. Every time you come, every time you go, you remember this is God's house. You don't forget who stocks your shelves, as it were, who takes care of you. Some people will kiss the mezuzah as they go by to remember and as a reminder. In Israel, you saw them on virtually every door. I think maybe not the bathroom doors, if I remember right, I'm not sure. But they were pretty much on every other door. So, we ask God to give us our daily bread. 
But if we already have our daily bread, sometimes we forget. God doesn't want us to forget him and his provision. So he laid out all these things for Israelites to do so that they would never forget him and what he's done for them. So the prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. Notice the us again in there. And I spent a lot of time talking about us last time, so I won't do it this time. But I want to draw your attention. The prayer continues in the plural. It's not about me. It's we. It's about us. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts. We need to pray for one another as we have forgiven our debtors. So that's an interesting thing. We ask God to forgive us in the same way that we forgive others. I really wish that wasn't in the prayer. <laughs> Just forgive me, God, irrespective of how good I'm doing on this end. Whether I forgive somebody or not, don't hold that against me. You know how they wronged me. I can't forgive them, but forgive me. And I drew to your attention this concept of debt as the word here, not sin. And why is that? Well, Yeshua told the story. And I'm going to share that story with you in just a minute. But there was another story behind that story. There was some teaching, then there was a story. Everybody knows the story, but they forget the teaching before the story, and it fills out the picture. Somebody walks into your house, takes a shotgun to your face, kills, your, kills you, kills your neighbors, kills your loved ones. You're, I've got to forgive them. Jesus said so. That's not the whole story. Listen to the whole story. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. So here's Yeshua talking about forgiveness. He says, if somebody's wronged you, you go talk to them. Don't let it sit. You go talk to them. And if you've won him over, that's great. But if he will not listen to you, Take along one or two others, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the congregation. And if he refuses to listen to the congregation, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Where's the forgiveness? It's offered, it's offered, it's offered. But if the person refuses to acknowledge the evil that they've done, you reject them. Turn them over to God. Let God deal with them. Maybe in a week, a month, a year, maybe their heart will be touched. Because it wasn't just you now. This wasn't just between you and them. You brought along a couple witnesses who knew how they, eat, how they wronged you. And they wouldn't listen to them either. So then you took it to the congregation and the elders spoke to them. And they went like that to the elders. There's no hope for that person. There's no way for reconciliation when that person is behaving that way. You did everything you could do. You did. You tried. You tried and you tried and you tried. But they refused to be reconciled. They refused. You're willing. You can't reconcile one party. It takes two to tango. It takes two to smoke the peace pipe. They refused. So you keep praying that someday they'll listen. Until then, there's nothing you can do. Your heart is fine because you're willing. But they're not willing, so later. Then he told the famous story. And here's what he said. Peter came to Yeshua and asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Yeshua answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. This translation says 77, but all the others say 70 times seven. It's not like you've got to sit there and calculate it. When they hit that number, you're done. The point was an exaggeration. If somebody repents, if they apologize, you always forgive them. There's never a limit. If they're sincere in their apology, you forgive them. So he went and told the story with another exaggeration in it. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Don't think of the scullery maid. The servant of a king could be another king. Anybody under him. So if you're the emperor, any regional king is also your servant. The kingdom of heaven is like this. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. 10,000 talents. A talent of gold is about as much as a man weighs. 
back in those days, an estimate of 110 pounds, even though men weighed more than that. So just for convenience sake, call it 100 pounds of gold. How much is that in today's market? Holy cow. And how much did this guy owe him? Ten thousand talents. Obviously, this is an exaggeration. This is the entire budget of three countries. This guy owed him an amount of money he couldn't possibly pay back. That's what Yeshua was saying. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Yeah, that would help. But at least he could recoup something. Maybe the guy had huge assets, vineyards and, and cattle and who knows. All I know is that the man owed him, he couldn't pay, so he's going to sell him. But the servant fell on his knees before him. He said, be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. So the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Canceled the debt? We're not talking 100 bucks here. We're talking billions. Ah, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Talk about grace and mercy. Talk about love and compassion. That's the point of the story. Whoever this master was, he had a heart of gold. So the servant went away, and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. A denarii was like a day's wage. So compared to the, what he owed the king, this is like chump change. So he go, grabs this guy by the throat and starts strangling him. Pay me back what you owe me! Be patient with me, I promise, I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he'd pay back his debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. So the master called the servant in. He said, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. Let me tell you something. You cannot calculate the value of sin against God. It's a 10,000 talents of gold. You can't calculate it. It's, it's, it's impossible to pay that debt. You cannot pay your sin debt to God. You are toast. All you can do is ask him to forgive you. And because of Jesus' sacrifice and the love of the Father... He will. But if somebody does something wrong to you and asks for your forgiveness, and you say no, that's the story Yeshua told to show you how selfish, how stupid, how bad that is, how churlish. Listen, I'm a human being. I have a hard time forgiving some people sometimes too. That's irrelevant. This is what God requires of us. Man up. If you're a woman, you shouldn't be upset right now because you're a woman up. <laughs> Everybody needs to step up and do what's right. And let me tell you something. You probably know this. When you forgive somebody that has wronged you because they ask, it feels good and makes you feel like a bigger and better person. If you've ever had that experience, let me see your hands, please. Wow, almost everybody. It feels good. You know, when I was a kid, Hanukkah was okay. I mean, kids like getting presents, but I never really got just what I wanted. But when I became a daddy and started giving presents to my kids, Hanukkah got much better. I much rather give presents than receive presents. Giving forgiveness is like giving a present. It just makes you feel good inside. Forgiveness to those who seek it is always to be granted a repentant person. A repentant person is never to be turned away. That's what it means when he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then this prayer, this is, this is a biggie. 
and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Don't lead us into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Hey, it's rough out there, people. You know it. You need all the help you can get. So you ask God to help you. Help him. Help remove temptation from my path. You may even know what those things are that trip you up. A handsome man. A fifth. An ounce. A book. A mean, nasty person at work. Ask God to make the way clear for you. You know, the, the Bible tells us to resist the devil and he will flee. We have a part to do. It's not just asking God. We've got an active part to do. We're told to put on the armor of God. And we're told to take every thought captive and make it subject to the will of Messiah. We have a part to do. And part of our part to do is to pray to God and ask him to clear the way for us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Us. Pray about your problems, and then please pray about mine. And the sister sitting to your left, and the brother sitting to your right, and your kids, and your parents, and your brothers, and your neighbors, and your presidents, especially your presidents. That man, he needs your prayers. Pray for him. So how do we resist temptation? Well, take on the armor of God. Take every thought captive, resist the devil. But you can get creative. It's hard for truckers always away from home, for businessmen always traveling to be faithful to their spouses. So I found this video to help you understand how creative you can be in resisting temptation. Let's take a look. Here we are. the still of the night And baby, all I know My poor heart skips a beat When you're next to me In the still of the two guys in the elevator alone. <laughs> Resist the devil and he will flee. Hey, we all struggle with the same things. We're all human. But God's got a path for us. He wants us to walk. We ask him to help us walk it. And then we do everything we can to walk it ourselves. If you're walking with the Lord, I can't tell you what your temptations are. Only you know. I can't tell you what's tripping you up though I can give you the list that most of us struggle with. But I tell you what, if you're not walking with the Lord, I know what your biggest struggle is right now. It's ambivalence. It's faithlessness. It's mistrust of God. That's your problem right now. So your prayer, asking God to deliver you from evil, would really be delivering you from your own faithlessness and your own ambivalence. And that's a good prayer to make, by the way. If you don't believe in God, or worse yet, you do believe in him, but you don't follow him with all your heart, why? What's wrong with you? Ask God to help you, because you know it's right. And if you do love God and you're walking with him, but you keep tripping up, ask him to help you. And then do this. Recognize where you are, and don't judge anybody else. Because if you realize your own faults and failures, there's no room for judging. Because only perfect people get to judge. So we'll leave that up to Yeshua. Please join me in prayer. Lord God in heaven, thank you for teaching us how to pray. And I do pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that you would give us our daily bread, not just my family, but all these people here. And that you'd forgive us our debts 
And please help us forgive our debtors. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever and ever. Amen. If you are struggling with something and want some help, uh, we've got a prayer room over there. I'm going to ask some of our prayer people, our leaders, to join you over there after services to pray for you and to help you. We're only a phone call and an email away. There's lots of people in this congregation that would love nothing more than to give you a buzz and pray with you. So don't walk it alone. It's a hard walk. Would you please stand and join us?
He is great, and he loves you, and he's got an amazing plan for your eternity. Trust him with your soul. Please bow your heads for the ironic benediction, and you'll be dismissed. Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vikunecha Yis Adonai Panavalecho Vyoseim Lecho Shalom May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Shabbat shalom, everybody. God bless. Shabbat shalom.